Right, so today I'm going to cover paper 6, the alternative to the practical, and this is for physics. The course code is 0625 slash 63, and this is for October, November 2018. And it's the paper for the Cambridge International Examinations. So, without further ado, let's do Great. it. Great, let's get started. Question 1. A student is determining the density of modelling clay. He is using the block shown in figure 1.1 and figure 1.2. Part A1. Measure the dimensions of the block of modelling clay as shown in figure 1.1 and figure 1.2. Right, okay, so what do we need here? We need the length, the width and the height. And what it's asking us to do is physically take a ruler and measure it. Now, I took a ruler and I measured it, and the ones that I got had a measurement of 5.5 centimetres, uh, 2.8 and 3.6. But these are all wrong, according to the answers in the back. Why? Because I don't have a physical exam paper. What I've done is taken uh, the PDF file and printed it out. And because of that, because it's being printed onto, say, a letter size page, it's rescaled it, resized it. So it may well be the case that when you measure this, you don't get the same answers that are in the mark scheme. Don't worry about it. There's every likelihood is because it's been resized, rescaled. So the actual answers that it's looking for in the back or in the mark scheme are 6.0 centimetres, 3.0 centimetres and 4.0 centimetres. There we are. Make sure those decimal points are nice and visible. Excellent. That's the answers you should have. If your answers are different because the sizing is different, because it's been resized, don't worry about it. That's okay. That can't be helped. It's all good practice. Part 2. Calculate the volume V1 of the block using your measurements from the above question. And the equation V1 is L times W times H, which is length times width times height. All right, let's do that now. V1 equals L times W times H. There we are. And that gives us a value of 72 centimetres. Now, you'll notice I haven't, I haven't said 72.0 centimetres. Why? Well, here, two significant figures. Here, two significant figures. Here, two significant figures. So the answer should be two significant figures. And that's 72 centimetres cubed. B. Suggest a possible source of inaccuracy in measuring the dimensions of the block and describe an improvement to the procedure that will produce more reliable measurements of the block. Well, suggestions. It's pretty hard to measure uh, dimensions um, as they change. Here's an example of this. The length changes depending on where you are along the length of the block. So that's something that makes it awkward. So it's hard to measure the dimensions as they change. So improvement for that, well, I think probably a good way to improve that would be to measure each of these dimensions, the length, the length, the width and the height, in different places and take an average. There we go. So my answer, measure the dimensions in different places and average. In fact, you know what, I'm going to clarify that a little bit. I'm going to say measure each of. Measure each of the dimensions in different places and the average. There we go. Part C. The student suspends the piece of modelling clay from a force meter as shown in figure 1.3. Record the weight W of the block of modelling clay shown in figure 1.3. So record the weight that's shown on that newton meter. Or the force meter. There we are. And that says 1.4 newtons. And of course, the unit's actually already there, so that's good, but always check to make sure. If it's not there, you have to come up with it and put it in. Part D. Calculate a value, rule 1, for the density of the modelling clay using your results from A2 and C, the bit you've just done, and the equation rule 1 equals W times K divided by V1. And here, 
it's given you a value for k. Very important. If you don't have a value for k, you can't do this equation. There we are. It's given us that value. So let's calculate that out. So there we go. Rule 1 equals 1.4 newtons times 100 grams per newton divided by 72 centimeters cubed. Now, if we look at the answer section over here, what we'll find? No units. So we have to put the units in as well. Now let's just carry these over and we'll see we've got newtons that we're multiplying and divided by newtons at the same time. So we're going to end up with uh, 140 on top grams divided by 72 centimeters cubed. And if we put that through, we get 1.94 grams per centimeter cubed. There we go. And there we are. E. The student pours some water into a measuring cylinder as shown in figure 1.4. Record the volume V2 of the water in the measuring cylinder shown in figure 1.4. All right, so we have to have a look at the value of the volume here. Now, if you look at that, that looks like it's coming out around about here. That's uh, 5, 10, that's 160. 160 centimetres cubed. And the units are already in, so that's fine. Two, describe how a measuring cylinder is read to obtain an accurate value for the volume of water. You may draw a diagram to help you. Right, so it's just asking us how it's actually read. And we can draw a diagram. So here we go. Here we've got our measuring cylinder. Excellent. And it's got meniscus at the side of the measurement. There we go. All right. So what we want to do when we read these things oh, is read them at 90 degrees. So here we go. Perpendicular. And that will give us the best measurement. We also want to read from the surface and not the meniscus. So read from the level of the surface well, with the eye viewing at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the scale. There we are. So let's move on to F. The student rolls modelling clay into the water. Record the new reading V3 of the measuring cylinder with the block of modelling clay in the water. OK. There we go. So that's one gradation above 225. That's uh, 230. 230 centimetres cubed. Calculate another value, row 2, for the density of modelling clay using your value for V3 and your readings from C and E1. And this equation is about to give us uh, row 2 equals W times K divided by V3 minus v2 and of course k here we go given to us here 100 grams per newton so let's do that out uh, row 2 so i'm going to be 1.4 newtons again multiplied by 100 grams per newton so of course the newtons will cancel and we'll give us 140 grams at the top divided by 230 centimeters cubed minus 160 centimetres cubed. And I'm being quite careful to write in the units here because, of course, there are no units on this one, on the answer. So we have to make sure that we're getting the units in. So that's 140 grams divided by 70 centimetres cubed, which is 2.0, two significant figures, grams per centimetre cubed. All right. Let's write that in then. Part two, suggest which of row one or row two, so that's the density, the first density we measured or the second density, the one we've just done, is likely to be the more accurate value for the density of the modeling clay. And justify your answer by referring to the procedure. Okay, if you remember the first one, we measured the modeling clay on the page and it was a funny shape. 
We didn't do a great measurement of it, we calculated the volume from that. In the second measurement, density 2 or row 2, the modelling clay has been suspended directly in water. So we've got a much more accurate value for the volume of it. So that will give us a much better reading for the density. So density 2, to my thinking, is the most likely measurement. So let's just put that in. I think density 2, because we measured the volume directly, and we didn't calculate it approximately. And there we go. All right, let's move on to the next question. Question two. Some students are determining the resistance per unit length of wire X. They're using a circuit as shown in figure 2.1. Okay. So we've got the wire, we've got a resistance wire, moving crocodile clip. Let's see what the next thing is. The crocodile clip is connected to a length of resistance wire. The current in the circuit and potential difference across the wire are measured, across wire X. On figure 2.1, draw a symbol for the voltmeter connect, uh, correctly connected to measure the potential difference across wire X. So that's our key point. We have to measure potential difference across wire X. So here we have wire X. What we need to do then is measure the voltage across it, in which case we want to put a voltmeter here and connect one end of it to one end of wire X and the other end of it to the other end of wire X. There we are, just make sure everything's fully connected there. Right, let's move on to the next bit. B. A student adjusts the position of the crocodile clip until the current in the circuit is 0 0.80 amps. In table 2.1, record the value of the potential difference V across wire X as shown in figure 2.2. All right, so let's use our meter and see what it is. That's 1.5, 1 1.6 here, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 1.9 volts. There we are. Now we're being asked to record that in table 2.1. So let's come on and find table 2.1. There we are, so we can record that in here. 1.9 volts. I'm not sure why they've got so much accuracy in all these other readings, but I'm guessing they didn't use the meter we just did. Okay, so 1.9 volts. I'm not putting a zero at the end, just 1.9. So this is part C. The student records the potential difference V for different currents, as shown in Table 2.1. Excellent. So let's go down here. Plot a graph of V in volts in the y-axis against current in amps on the x-axis. Right. Well, we've got all our readings in the table above, so let's plot that graph. First things first, let's label the axes. All right, so I'm just about showing the full uh, graph paper on the page. I'm just going to count the number of squares I have. One, two... I've got 12 squares on the y-axis and 10 on the x-axis. This is going to go and become my y-axis, this is going to become my x-axis. So my y-axis I need to be able to read from 0 0.8 to 1.9. Right. So I absolutely need 11 squares to get a nice and easy scale going on there. But I need to jump in the axis to start at 0 0.8. So let's jump in that axis. 0 0.8, 1 1.0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 1 1.8, and up at the top 1.9. Then of course we want to they will this entire axis V in volts. I'm just going to bring it up here. If it just so happens that they haven't given me enough space to do it, I don't care about the writing on the paper. I'm going to make sure that it's clear which axis is which. And because I'm doing this on the computer, I'm going to put in a nice line on it. You'd want to do this with a ruler to make sure it's nice and clear where the axes are. Let's just neaten that up for the Y axis. And there we go, that's nice and clear. I've got my asymptote, my little jump, down there in the bottom of the line as well. Now I've got 10 squares I can do on the x-axis, so let's see what I need. So I've got to go from 0.4 to 0.8, so let's have a little bit of a look at what I think would be the best scale for that one. Now I'm going from 0.4 to 0.8, so I'm going to want to do a jump on this axis as well. Why? Well, because there's no other values that before 0.4, no values above 0.8, so that's where all my 
information is not 0.4, not 0.5, not 0.6, not 0.7, and not 0.8. There we go. Now it's drawing my little axis line. And make sure that that's labeled as well. Current in amps. Now I can put the information from the table onto my graph. And I'm going to start with the biggest number, which is the 0 0.8 for the current and 1.9 for the voltage. 0 0.8 is the farthest along on the x-axis. 1.9 is the farthest up on the y-axis, so it's right in this corner up here. Now it'll be easier to do all the other ones because they'll fit in the screen. There we go. So we've put in all our points. They're all labeled on the graph now. Let's go down and see the next part of the question. Determine the gradient G of the graph. Show clearly on the graph how you obtain the necessary information. Right. What that means is draw a straight line of best fit. And then once you've got that straight line of best fit, draw a big triangle to show the section that you're actually using to calculate the gradient. That's important. So there we go. I've got my best line fit. Now what I need to do is make sure it's nice and clear. I've got a big triangle happening here and that's how I'm getting my measurements. All right, once you've drawn the triangle in, label your points. Right, now I've labeled the points. What I want to do is calculate the gradient. So the gradient equals my change in y divided by change in x. Minus 0 0.90 divided by a change in x, which is 0 0.8 minus 0 0.45. Put that into the calculator, and that gives the value of 2.8. There we are. And the units for the green, well, let's just look at that. What we have on the y-axis is in volts. What we have on the x-axis is in amps. So the units are just volts, amps, negative 1. Let's write that in. There we go. Let's move on to the next part. Part 3. Figure 2.3 shows Y or X. On figure 2.3, measure the length L. Okay, now, as before, I measured it and I got 4.1 centimetres. But that's because I'm measuring it on a piece of paper where it's been scaled down to fit. And you may well get a similar uh, change compared to the answer than what's expected. So the answer that's expected is 4.5 centimetres. And if you happen to have an old copy of the physical exam that was given out at the time because they printed their own paper size, it will most likely give you that as the answer. All right, the wire in figure 2.3 is shown to one third of the scale. Calculate the actual length, L of the wire. All right, well, if that's one third of the scale, then the actual length would be three times bigger. Now it gives 13.5 centimetres. So as I say, if you measure it and get the wrong measurement, if you've printed off the PDF, it's probably rescaled it. Obviously, check it again to make sure, but if it has, you're not going mad. It's absolutely fine. Four, calculate resistance R of each centimetre of wire X using the equation R equals the gradient times K divided by L. Ooh, that's an interesting one, isn't it? They've given us a value for K. But in the last question, they also used K, and it was a different value. It was like 100 grams per newton. So be aware of that. They've thrown in K, but it's a different question. We get a different value in a different situation. Give the value of, for R to a suitable number of significant figures for this experiment. All right. Well, let's do our calculation first. R is 2.8 volt amps. I'm writing up my units here, because if you look over here, there's no units. That being said, here we go, it's the resistance. So the final units should be ohms. There we are. So 2.8 volt amps times 1.0 ohm centimeters. Oh, and it's amps negative one. There we go. Divided by L, which is 13.5 centimeters. Okay, and our final answer here should be 0 0.21 ohms. 
That's 0 0.21 ohms. D. A student notices that the resistance wire becomes very hot when the crocodile clip is connected to short lengths of wire, suggest an improvement that would help to reduce this effect. Well, I think use smaller voltages would really help. Smaller voltage will give you smaller current, less heating. There we are. Question 3. A student is investigating the reflection of light by a plane mirror. A ray trace sheet is shown in figure 3.1, which is a picture underneath. OK. Right. A1. Measure and record in table 3.1 the angle alpha between AN and CN, as shown in figure 3.1. OK. So the angle alpha between A and C. Now I measured that and I got 20 degrees. We'll just mark that on the diagram. There we go, that's 20 degrees. That's the angle that we're measuring. So now we have to put that in the table, which is table 3.1 on the next page. Don't have to write degrees because it's already up there in the table. So 20 degrees. Now let's go to the next part of the question. A2. Draw a normal to AB, the line AB, at point N. Towards the top of the page. Alright, so we're drawing a normal line going up towards the top of the page. Label the top point of this normal line L. Alright. There we are, and I have to label the top of that line, L. Excellent. What's our next part? Two pins, P1 and P2, are placed on line LN, a suitable distance apart for ray tracing. On figure 3.1, label suitable positions for P1 and P2. OK. We're just putting two pins in, a reasonable distance apart, quite far. So I'll put one way up here. I shall call that pin 1, P1, and one down here, and I'll call that P2. And I've just taken a certain amount of uh, direction off the ones they've already drawn on. Look, I can see a P5, a P6 down here. You can see they're quite far away, they're quite close. In general, you'd want to have them quite f one quite far away from the mirror, much closer to the edge of the page, and one quite close into the mirror, into the mirror but not up against the mirror. So you want a reasonable distance in between it, but as much space between them as you can put in reasonably. OK, so that's done. Two pins have been put in, two pins have been labelled. Let's move on to the next part. B. The student places the reflecting surface of a plane mirror on line CD and views the images of P1 and P2. OK, from a direction indicated by the eye. All right. Ah, here we go. We've got an eye up top. Here's our eye up the very top here. There we are. So they put in a mirror along the line CD. Let's continue with that question. She places two pins, P3 and P4, so that the images of P1 and P2 and the pins P3 and P4 all appear exactly one behind the other. Part 1. Draw a line passing through P3 and P4, reaching the point N. OK. He wants us to draw a line P3, P4, N. So let's put that in now. There we go. Part 2. Measure the angle theta between this line and the normal LN. Or it's between the line we've just drawn and that normal line we drew at the start, or near the start. There we go. So what it's asking us to do then is measure this angle here. And when we do that, certainly when I measured it, I got an angle of 40 degrees. There we are. So that's my angle, 40 degrees. Now I have to record this information in the table. So, 40 degrees. C. The student moves the mirror to a line EF at an angle alpha of 35 degrees to AN. The line EF is not shown. OK, so they've taken the mirror and they've moved it around a little bit further. So it went from A to C and it's gone a little bit further around to some point called F or E. There we are, that's absolutely fine. They just haven't drawn it in. And if they haven't drawn it in, it's probably not going to be necessary to draw anything in. So let's see. 
The student repeats the process and places pins P5 and P6. OK, draw a line passing through P5 and P6, reaching point N. So same again. There we are, we've drawn that in now. Part C2, measure the angle theta between this new line and the normal LN. Record this value in table 1.3. OK, so let's go back up. We're being asked to measure another angle. We're being asked to measure this angle here between LN and that new line we've drawn in. Now, when I measured it earlier on, I got 68 degrees. All right, so now let's look at the next part. Let's write that down in our table. So 68 degrees. Let's look at part D. D, a student suggests that when the mirror is moved, the change in theta should be equal to twice the change in alpha. State whether you're reading support this idea and justify your answer with reference to the readings. Okay, so there's a couple of key points here. One, this is worth two marks. And two, it wants us to justify the answer with reference to the readings. So we're going to have to quote a reading in there or two just to justify what we're doing. So that means we can't just get away with, well, it is reasonable or the same within the limits of experimental accuracy, which is our, our sort of go-to statement. We need to pull out some of the figures and prove it. And also we need to check see whether or not it's true anyway. So first things first, what we're actually saying is that we would expect theta to be two times alpha. So start with 20 degrees, multiply that by two, I get 40 degrees. So that's right. I start with 35 degrees, I multiply by 2, I get 70 degrees. Well, that's pretty close to 68 degrees. It's very close. So I'd say that's the same. They're both the same. Uh, I would say that theta is equal to 2 alpha within the limits of experimental accuracy. That would be my first part. The second part would be to quote some of these values. Okay, so let's start answering that question. Um, state whether you're going to support this idea. Yes, they do within the limits of experimental accuracy. Right, so I've got one mark. What I need to do now is quote the results I just wrote down in order to get uh, the rest of the marks. So 40 degrees equals two times 20 degrees. And 68 degrees is very close to 70 degrees, which is two times 35 degrees. And there we go, we've answered the question. E suggests two precautions you should take to ensure accurate results from this type of experiment. Well, number one for these is always view the pins from the base because the top of the pins move around. And number two, of course, the way to make it more accurate is make sure that the pins are far apart. So there we go. View the pins from the base and to make sure that the pins are placed far apart or far apart. Excellent. Let's move on to the next one. Question four. A student is investigating the conduction of thermal energy by metals. Plan an experiment to, conduct, uh, to compare the rates at which different metals conduct thermal energy. The apparatus available includes strips of a different metal shaped as a little hook thing underneath is 4.1, uh, a test tube in a clamp stand, a beaker, a supply of cold water, and a supply of hot water. Okay, the shorter section of each strip of metal can fit inside a test tube. Now, write a plan for the experiment. You should list any additional apparatus needed, draw a labeled diagram of how the apparatus will be arranged, explain briefly how you will carry out the experiment, explain how the metals would be compared, and state the precautions which should be taken to obtain reliable results. OK. Let's examine a couple of things first. We're being asked to compare the rates at which different metals conduct thermal energy. So talking about time, we need something to measure time. Stopwatch. And we're talking about 
metals conducting thermal energy. So we're going to need ways to measure that change in thermal energy. We're going to need some thermometers. So let's have a look at what kind of setup we could do. All right, so this is the sort of setup I'm thinking about. We've got the clamp and stand, we've got the test tube. The test tube's holding cold water. The metal strip, one end of it goes into the cold water and the other end of it goes down into a beaker of hot water. The hot water is insulated to prevent heat loss and there's a thermometer in both the cold water and the hot water. It's a bit of a confusing diagram, so I'm just gonna shade in the water section. So here we go, so I've got water in here and I've got water in here. The one in the bottom is warm water. The one in the little test tube is cold water. So we're expecting heat to flow up the metal strip to heat up the cold water in the test tube. Not a great experiment as experiments go, but it uses all the equipment that they have, or that they've given us, which is a test tube and a clamp stand, the beaker, supply of cold water and hot water, and we need stopwatch and two thermometers to do this. Okay. So now what we need to do is start running through that as a description. Now my thinking is this. What we're going to want to do is control the temperature of the hot water, at least the start temperature of the hot water and the start temperature of the cold water. Then we time for a period of time, say five minutes, and we see after five minutes what the new temperature of the cold water is. And when we do that, we can then calculate a rate of the temperature change for each metal. So every time we'll do the same start temperature from hot, for the hot water, same start temperature for the cold water, and we'll change the metal strip each time. And if we want to make it better in the future, then we'd use more than one measurement for each metal strip and average the results. So let's have a go at writing that up. So the very first instruction would be set up the equipment as above. You'll also need two thermometers, a stopwatch and some insulation. So there we go. Part one, set up the equipment as above. In addition to provided equipment, you will need two thermometers, a stopwatch and some insulation. Now, let's run through it, if you like, for the first time. So at the start of each experiment, ensure the following. The hot water is at 70 degrees Celsius, at the same start temperature. The cold water is at 15 degrees Celsius, so the same start temperature each time for both of those. Then we're going to want to start the stopwatch in time for five minutes and record the final temperature of the cold water. Now, of course, once you've done that, after five minutes you record the final temperature of the cold water on the table. We'll design that in a second. What you're going to want to do is replace the metal strip with a new metal strip, a different type of metal, and start again. So repeat the experiment. So we repeat this with a different metal strip until all of the metal strips have been used. Then calculate the rate of the temperature change of the water in the table. So now let's design the table. We're going to need columns for the metal, the start temperature of the test tube, the end temperature of the test tube, and the rate of temperature change. So there we go, that's the table that I would use. We've got the metal, the start temperature of the test tube, which is always going to be 15, that's an hour instructions in temperature of a test tube would be recorded and then you'd calculate the rate of change or the rate of temperature change okay and you can see there it's t2 minus t1 divided by 300 seconds 300 seconds because it's a five minute period all right so once you have that results what you would do for the different metals is compare the rates of temperature change of the water and the one which is the highest temperature change will have the best thermal conductivity. And that should be it. Well, let's just write that down. There we go. Compare the rate of temperature change of water and the metal strip with the highest value will have the best thermal conductivity. And that's it. Our experiment is finished. If you found that useful, please feel free to like and subscribe. And if you've got anything that you'd like us to cover, please uh, leave a message in the comment section below. And, uh, have a great day.